Is it possible to just take an object, pick it up? This is a stone and a f flower lying on top of it. But I've already interpreted it now through the mind. I've explained to you what it is. Is it possible to be some in your room and be in a relationship to objects that is non-conceptual where you allow each object to be each object that you perceive so completely that you're not interpreting it or labeling it so you pick something up You feel it and you see it. It has a presence. And you let it be. And you're seeing it. Through stillness. At first you might think well, certainly the thinker thinks that this is not possible. You, as the thinker, thinks no. And besides, what's the point? I mean, I've got other things to worry about. <laughs> it's hard to see. It seems such a simple and insignificant thing to do that and to make that as part of your spiritual practice. And you st could start with the world of objects nature also, of course, but we relate to objects when we talk in terms of relationships. People think relationships to human beings. You relate even more to objects because wherever you are, you are relating to the world of objects, so-called inanimate, not really inanimate, but so-called inanimate objects. You're always picking something up, you're sitting somewhere on something, handling something. It's the world of objects, and usually each object that you handle is a means to an end. You want to achieve something through it. Because in the mind-dominated state, each moment, or rather the one moment, is always reduced to a means to an end. Thereby you miss the fullness of life that can only be in the moment that and actually realize that true intelligence lives beyond conceptual thought. Conceptual thought comes out of true intelligence, is one of many m possible manifestations of it. But when you are trapped in this one little manifestation of intelligence, then your life is reduced to very little, a very limited entity, problematic entity. <laughs> and then you inflict suffering on yourself through conceptual thought. You begin to have dialogues with yourself and telling yourself something, what, who you are and <laughs> not enough. <laughs> so to gradually become free of being dominated by conceptual thought, continuous labeling and interpreting and judging. That's why to pick something up is such a powerful spiritual practice. It seems so insignificant and the mind might tell you that you have better things to do than pick something up and look at it. At first it may not be, thought may still be there. And then perhaps there's a moment when there's just looking, just the awareness, the perception. Very different qualitative difference in that perception from a conceptualized, uh, from a perception reduced by conceptualization. And then you sense that even a stone has an aliveness to it. 
which nothing is alive when it's seen through mental concepts. <laughs> and it may be that the other person st still operates through that screen. And the beauty is that when you no longer impose that screen, then it is actually possible to look through the screen that is in the other person. You see the screen, but you don't give it all that much attention. You don't, you don't take it to be the reality of who that person is. You realize it is the human condition. It is a manifestation of the human condition. This has been the human fate for many thousands of years. And you don't manufacture a personal identity for that person out of that. <laughs> That's, and then say, now I really know who he or she is. <laughs> Whereas the truth is, now you really know who he or she is not. <laughs> now, the true meaning of forgiveness is not to mistake that screen which often is energized by the pain body, which is old emotional pain accumulated over millennia in the human collective psyche because of that very dysfunction, Be because all that pain has continuously been created. Each human created it for themselves and for others, all the enormous inconceivable pain and suffering inflicted by humans on other humans and they didn't know what they were doing. But that pain, because of that, and we must call it dysfunction, because of that, there is such an accumulation of emotional pain in the human psyche, the collective pain body, plus the personal pain body from your lifetime. And so that amplifies very often that conceptual reality with emotion. And <laughs> So you can, the, your old pain flows into that madness. It's already madness. And now it becomes even more mad. So forgiveness is simply, it's not the way people practice forgiveness doesn't really work all that well. <laughs> uh, I forgive you. I <laughs> don't need to say I forgive you. There's nothing to forgive suddenly anymore. So true forgiveness happens only when suddenly you have seen so clearly through that there's nothing to forgive anymore. For forgiveness? No, what for? And that applies to yourself because some people can't forgive themselves for something. No. It is p very likely that there's far greater consciousness in you than 10 years ago. So you have moved through, you have f f manifested the human condition in one way or another, you had to. So it's likely that you did certain things that at your present level of consciousness you would not do because now there's far greater presence. But when you look back, there can be a tendency for the mind to manufacture an identity for yourself out of the movement of unconsciousness. So you can, you can see the incredible transformation that is here, that is not just in this little space here, how it Everything gets transformed through that. <laughs> you don't need to want to transform it. It happens. Your state of consciousness determines your world. <laughs> and that's all that's needed. When you truly know beyond concepts, 
beyond thought. That's the new state of consciousness. And this is why there's a field of presence here that does not just come through this form, it comes through all these forms that are losing their density, mental, emotional density and identification with the density as me. And as the density is becoming less dense, something shines through it. And that's where you, the depth is suddenly there within yourself. So, all these fields of consciousness, which is really what you are, a field of, it looks like a walking human being, and at the end of this retreat, you walk out of here back to where you go, but really, you're a field of consciousness, and that, the, like seeds, moving out into different parts of the world, and then you begin to perceive and relate to the world in this new way. Vital questions, I would say, I'm not discouraging you from asking questions tomorrow, but vital questions, that, not abstract conceptual questions, vital questions, I would say you already have the answer to yourself. If you, you really need to know the answer, become still. Ask the question and then let go. If you need to know it, the answer comes from within, out of the stillness, which is the vastness of intelligence itself. How could it not come? If it's not vital, the question will disappear in the stillness. <laughs> you never needed to know. <laughs> you just thought you did. <laughs> if you need to know it, the answer comes from within, out of the stillness, which is the vastness of intelligence itself. How could it not come? If it's not vital, the question will disappear in the stillness. <laughs> you never needed to know. <laughs> you just thought you did. And there's a lot that we don't need to know. 